All right, praise the Lord. Let me take a moment to greet those that are online. Uh, we're so blessed to have you tune in with us. If we can be a blessing, please let us know, but we're so glad that you've joined us uh, if you couldn't be here. And for those of you that are here, it is so good to see you guys. It's a, it's a joy to be amongst the living, a joy to be alive, a joy to be with God's family. I, heard, I hope that you've had an incredible week, and uh, we pray for you throughout the week, and I just pray that you uh, have been blessed and that you've been able to apply the principles that you're learning from God's Word uh, to your everyday life. But as you've already heard announced and you've heard me pray, today we wrap up our series uh, rooted, and so I pray that you've been blessed and encouraged um, and that you're more rooted to God and His Word. As we close out the series today, I want to address how to continue to maintain a heart and a hunger for God's Word, how to continue to maintain this hunger for God, and how to continue to develop in what we've learned in the past six weeks, in the past 40 days, that you will continue in these things. You know, Jesus said something. Jesus said in John 8, 31, if you continue in my word, he says, you are truly my disciples, if you continue. The reason why Jesus said, if you continue in my word, is because not everyone will continue. Not everyone will continue to develop. Not everyone will continue to mature in their understanding of God through his word. So Jesus says, if you continue, you will be my disciples. You know, the, the litmus test of a true follower and disciple of Christ is their continued commitment and devotion to God through his word. That's the litmus test, right? You know, it's not if you continue for 40 days, if you continue for the campaign series, right? But if you live a life that is committed to Christ and his truth, you are my true disciples, you know, I, I love what uh, Psalms 138, verses 2 says. It says, for you have magnified your word above your name. You have magnified your word above your name. In other words, God honors his word above his own name. And I, I mentioned that verse because it's important for us to, to understand something, that God takes his word very seriously. You know, when we come into the house of the Lord, as we come to gather as saints, you know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, don't come like the foolish do, and they just, you know, they treat their, their time with God very cavalierly, very flippantly, but we should come to hear from God. We should come with a listening ear because God takes what he says very seriously, and the, the truth of the matter is, at the end of Ecclesiastes, Solomon kind of sums it up as he says, you know, here's the final conclusion. The final conclusion is that one day we're going to step into eternity and we're going to give an accounting for all the things that, you know, God has given to us, all the things that he said to us. We're going to answer for those things. And so it's really important for us not to take it cavalierly, but to come with a listening ear because some of those things, believe it or not, will serve to not only enhance and enrich and edify your life, but serve to save your life, save you from heartache and heartbreak and from many of the, the troubles and the pitfalls that you will face in life. And this is why God gives us the counsel of his word. And so it's really important that we continue in his word. Again, Jesus didn't say, if you continue in my word for a season, you will be my disciples. He says, if you continue in my word, then you will be my disciples, right? If you continue in it, if you remain in it, if you stay true to it, you'll be true disciples of Christ. And so this morning, I want to address how to integrate God's Word into every area of our lives as I wrap up the series. And I, you know, I just want to take a moment not to apologize for the Word, because God's Word is infallible, and it is perfect, and it is awesome. But last Sunday, I gave you a lot to digest and you know, I, I, I walked away. I felt like it was one of those messages that kind of went, you know. And so if I gave you guys too much, I apologize for that. I just, my heart is that you would come to know really how to understand Scripture. I want you to be able to look at your Bible and not just wait for Sundays to hear whether it's me or Pastor Steve or Pastor Darren teach, but that you can open your Bible and say, I understand what this means because you understand context. 
But, if, if, but again, I felt like I gave you so much, and I did my best to try to, you know, do a better job, and, and, and I apologize that I didn't. Anyway, um, I hope today's goes a little bit differently, but today I want to talk about how to integrate God's Word into every area of our lives, which is really important. You know, interestingly, the word integrate or integration, as you guys know, is the opposite of segregation, right? Integration is the opposite of segregation. Segregation means to separate into groups. That's what segregation means. So when you segmentize your life, you are living a segregated life, right? For example, when you have the mentality or you have the, uh, the attitude that this is my professional life, but this is my personal life. This is my home life, but this is my church life. This is my social life, but this is my private life, right? Now, I get that we all, you know, there's, function, there's different areas of our lives, but as I was doing a, a, a word study, I learned something new, and it's this. The word integrity actually comes from the same root word as integrated, okay? The same root word. The word integrity comes from the word integrated. To have integrity actually means to live an integrated life. That's what it means. It means to live an integrated life. In other words, you don't act one way with one group of people over here and then act another way with another group of people over here, right? Because that is a segregated life. That's not what God calls us to do, right? Our lives are to be integrated. Your life is, is not to be segmented off, right? You're to live an integrated life, right? Not a segregated life. You don't, you know, you don't want to be a different person that you are at home than you are at work. You don't want to be a different person that you are at school th than you are with your friends. You want your life to be integrated, not separated, right? You want to be the same person in every area of your life, whether you're at church or at work or with a family or with your friends, because your life is integrated. And this, in essence, is what integrity is. Integrity is a true representation of a whole person, right? You don't compartmentalize your life, but it is integrated. You're the same person that you are in, in front of others that you are at home. And I'd like to believe that, that I'm the same person that I am with my wife, with my family, that I am with you. I don't talk differently at home. I don't curse at my wife. I don't curse at my children. And I don't curse at you. I don't talk that way because I don't want to live a segregated life right? I want my life to be a life that is integrated, a life of integrity, right? And this is the kind of life that God calls every single one of us to live, a life of integrity that is, again, integrated, integrated, right? David says this in Psalms 119 verses 20, and I love what he says. He says, what I want most of all, in other words, the priority of my life, the thing that is most important to me, David says, and he says, at all times, that means it's integrated, not just at church, but at all times, is to honor your laws or to honor your word. What David is basically saying is, I want to be a man of the word, whether I'm at work or I'm at home, whether I'm playing with my kids or I'm on the golf course with my friends. I want to be the same guy. I want to be a man of the word, whether I'm, you know, with friends or I'm with strangers, I always want to be a good representation of who you are and what your word says. You know, I want to be the same person. I want to be a person of the word. I want my life to reflect the values of your word. I want to be led and guided by your word. I want to be governed by your word. I want to be built up by your word. I want to be this person all the time, all the time. And if there's anything I want to encourage you as believers to strive for, is that a life that is integrated because there's nothing more attractive than that kind of a life. You and I both know the things that turn people off are fakes and phonies and counterfeits. And I think that that is the greatest disservice that you can do to the church, that you can do to the faith, right? When your life is, is segregated, when it, when it is, you know, it's not what it is, you know what I mean? You only are giving a persona of who you are, but not the character of who you are. You do a disservice when you try to share your faith because they know 
yeah, this person talks very spiritual at church, but at work I hear this person cussing like, like a pirate. You know what I mean? Uh, or, or I hear this person tell, telling these kind of filthy jokes. Yeah, but at church he's hallelujah, praise the Lord, God bless you. But when he's with his friends, he's a total different guy. Right? You don't want to do that because you do a disservice to God, to the faith, and to the church. Because, again, people may not ever, as you've heard me say this before, they may, may not ever pick up this book. They may not ever step into this building. But you can be certain, the moment you tell them they're a Christian, they're reading your life. They're watching your life. They watch what you say. They watch how you live. They watch how you act. You don't think people watch me? People watch me all the time, all the time, you know? And, uh, and it's funny. You know, I, I, there's a guy that I, I work out with, and uh, he's constantly watching me. I, I see it. He, he watches me all the time, you know? As a matter of fact, he thought that I was checking out this girl, which I wasn't. I actually thought it was my niece, Jade. And, I, you know, he goes, dude, what are you looking? I said, dude, I thought it was my niece, man. You know what I mean? But again, I immediately recognized that he's watching me. He's watching my life. People will study your life, and it's important that it's integrated, that it's a life of integrity, that it's not segregated, right? So it's really important that we do this. And so this morning in our last message of the series, I want to show you how to do that, how to live a life that is integrated, not segregated. Because you know what? I, I don't want any of us to live that kind of life because, again, it's not, it's not good for you and it's not good for the witness of Christ. And if there's anything that people need more than ever before, they need Jesus. How many of you can recognize the climate of the times that we're living in? We live in dark times. We live in dark times. We're seeing things. We're hearing things. The values that we are hearing and seeing today it's so dark. The things that are being said in schools, the things that are being taught in schools, the things that are happening today, it's just scary, right? And so we, you know, we need to be a good representation of the Lord. But here's the good news. Even though the times are dark, the good news is this. The light shines brightest when it's dark. And the Bible says God has called us to be light. He's called us to be light. And so this is our hour. God has given us a time to shine in the darkness because it is dark today. And God wants to use you, believe it or not, in your sphere of influence, your circle of influence, whether it's at work or at home or in your community, God wants to use the witness of your life. And so I want to look at how to integrate our life, right? And so I'm going to talk about five very simple things. If, if you're going to become a person who's uh, integrated God's word into every area of your life. Number one, I must build on the word of God. I must build on it. In other words, I make the Bible, God's word, the foundation of my life. I make the Bible my foundation. Why is this important? It's important because like a building, the foundation determines how strong the structure is going to be, right? Right? Whenever I talk to young people, whenever I talk to a couple that is getting ready to start their lives, I always talk to them about foundational things. Whenever I do premarital, it's always about foundational things because the foundation of your life will determine the structure of your life. So important, right? And so it's, it's what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 7, as we've talked about a great deal. At the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock or who built his house on a solid foundation. If you build on the rock of God's word, then you're going to build on the stability of something that never changes, that is sure, that is strong, right, that never changes. How many of you know that, and we've talked about this a great deal, that truth never changes, Truth never changes. If it was true a thousand years ago, it's true today, and it will be true a thousand years from now. Truth never changes. On the other hand, if you build on the shifting sands of opinion and what's popular at the moment, the foundation of your life is not going to be very strong because you're building on shifting 
sand. As a matter of fact, there are four common foundations that people build their lives on that you don't want to build your life on. Four common foundations. Number one, you don't want to build your life on popular culture. Popular culture. culture. Some people build their life on popular culture because they think if it's popular, it must be good. If it's popular, it must be right. And if it's popular and everybody's doing it, well then, I should do it as well. You don't want to do that because the problem with that is whatever's popular today is going to be unpopular later on. That's just a fact, right? Whatever is in style today will be out of style tomorrow. Whatever is cool today is not going to be cool tomorrow. As a matter of fact, not too long ago, I was looking at some pictures from like 20, 30 years ago, and I asked myself, dude, what were you thinking wearing that? You ever, you ever ask yourself, what was I thinking? You, you know, you look at some of the, you, you guys remember those platform shoes that people, I mean, maybe that's back in style, I don't know. But you ever ask yourself, what was I thinking? There were these, these kind of like uh, pilot pants, I don't even remember what they were called. But you would wear these pants, and I have a picture like that, I'm thinking, dude, what were you wearing? I wouldn't be caught dead wearing that today. You know what I'm saying? Just look at pictures, and you, t- you remind yourself, that w- but... You know, it's funny, I'll look at that and I'll ask myself that question, I'll scratch my head, but then I realize, you know what, that was, that was cool, I was fresh back then, right? Even though somebody will look at it today and they'll say, dude, I don't know what was going through your mind. You ever look at some of the hairstyles? I mean, I don't have any anymore, but you ever look at some of the hair? If you saw pictures of my hair before, I used to have this really rockabilly haircut, it was like, like, I don't know how high, it was pretty high. Um. Anyway, but you know, again, if you build your life on popular culture, believe me, it's not going to be popular, you know, for very long. So you don't want to do this. Matter of fact, God says in Exodus 23 too, don't follow the crowd. Don't follow the crowd. Don't do what everybody's doing. You don't want to build your life on just what's popular because that's constantly shifting, right? That's constantly changing. And so it's important that we want to, we're building on things that are solid. The second thing you don't want to build your life on is on tradition. <clears throat> now, let me bring a balance. Not all traditions are bad, right? But you don't want to necessarily build on that because a lot of people build on traditions that are empty. It's not doing things because they serve a purpose, but it's doing things just because that's what we've always done or that's what I've always done, right? Right? And you don't want to do that. Now, again, are all traditions bad? Absolutely not. There's some good traditions. But the thing about traditions is that no tradition lasts forever. Do you know why? Because people die. Things die. And so traditions don't last forever, right? Truth, on the other hand, as I've already said, lasts forever. And so you want to build on things that are true. But traditions at some point will eventually become obsolete. You know, Jesus says to the religious leaders, and this was more of a rebuke to them. He says in Mark chapter 7, verses 8, you disregard the command of God, but you keep the traditions of men, right? You disregard what my word says, but you're faithful to keep your traditions, right? There's a lot of churches like this. They hold on to traditions that aren't even in the Bible, right? They're just something they've done for so long, they don't even know why they're doing in them anymore. You know, one of the things we do as leaders is that we're constantly looking at things and asking ourselves, you know, why do we do this? Why are we doing this? Is there a purpose behind what we do? Because we don't want to just do things just to do them, right? We want to make sure that the things that we do are based on what the Scripture says. That's what we do. That's how we, you know, we look at things. We always look at our our objectives, right? You have to look at what the ultimate objective is and and then make your decisions on how you do things. But you can't just do things just to do them. The fastest way for things to become stagnant is just to keep empty traditions going for, for no reason at all, for no purpose at all. That's when things die and become stagnant. They just become empty ritual. And so it's important. Just like when you come to church. That can happen when you come to church, but it's important you are reminded Why do I come to church every Sunday? Why do I go to connect group every week? Why do I do what I do? When you you go back to the Word of God, you begin to understand, this is why I do this, because the Bible says 
not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. Because the Bible says it's good when two or three to, are together. Jesus says what? I'm in the midst of that, right? So it serves a purpose, these things. You're not just doing them just to do them, but you're doing them because this is what God's word tells us to do. And so it's important to remind yourself of why you do what you do. The third thing you don't want to build your life is just human reasoning. Now, once again, let me bring balance to that. Thank God for the ability to reason, right? It's good that we know how to be reasonable, right? That, that's an important thing. That's an important quality in life, right? But here's the thing. You know, there are times what you think is reasonable is not actually right. How many of you know that? You may think it's reasonable, but it's not always right. Proverbs 3, 5 says this, and you guys know this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. But look how he follows that. Do not depend on your own understanding or your own reasoning or your own logic, right? Don't just depend on your own reasoning. When I rely on my own intellect and leave God out of the equation and do what seems only what is reasonable to me, it often ends up being a mistake, right? You can't just trust your own reasoning, as a matter of fact, you know, um, Proverbs 16, 25, sometimes a way seems right to a man, but the end of it leads to death. Things may seem reasonable to you at the time, but it could be leading you down a dead end. It could be leading you down a path that is harmful to you. Again, reason is a good thing, but make no mistake about it, our reasoning is not infallible. We don't have it all. We don't have all the answers. We don't know everything. And so it's so important that we are trusting this. And this is why God has given us his word because, as the Bible says, the law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. It's perfect. There is no flaw in God's word. And so you can trust it. When it talks to you about how to parent, when it talks to you about how to be a husband, when it talks to you about how to be a wife, when it talks to you to how to be an employer, an employee, when it talks to you about how to, how to have a good diet, when it talks to you how to be a good citizen, you want to pay attention because God's word is unchanging and it's true. If it was true a thousand years ago, it's true today. And it will be true a thousand years from today. And that's the beauty of God's word. It is infallible. It is inerrant. It is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. And so you can't just trust your own reasoning. How many times have you made a decision that you thought was reasonable, but it was a mistake? I can't tell you how many times I'm talking to people who rashly rushed into a relationship, and they'll tell me, I can't believe that I married this person, and it's turned into a train wreck. You know, because they, they, you know, they just, it was just motion. You know, I can't believe I got into this business. How did this happen? This is, a, this is a mess. I can't believe that I accepted this job offer out of state away from my family because I thought the money was great, not realizing the support that I was giving up, you know, for the money. I left my church family. I left my community. I left it all. I can't believe that. Why? Because you based it solely on your reason. I can't believe I made this investment. It's been a mess. I've lost so much money because it sounded reasonable at the time, but it has turned out to be a big mistake. What seemed like the right thing for a lot of people have turned into a nightmare and a disaster. Why? Because they've built their lives just on human reasoning, right? And so you don't want to do that. The fourth thing you don't want to build your life on is, and this is a no-brainer, is emotion. Not just emotion, right? A lot of people build their lives simply on emotion, right? If it feels right, it must be right, so I will do it, right? If it feels wrong, it must be wrong, so I won't do it, right? A lot of times, you don't, you know, your emotions are flawed, and so you want to be very careful with your emotions. Now, is, a, is emotions a bad thing? No. Thank God that we have emotions. Because if we didn't have emotions, things would be just sterile. And so God has given us emotions so that we can experience things, so that we can feel things. But the truth is, 
Our emotions are not perfect, right? And so you can't always trust them. Sometimes your feelings are highly, highly unreliable. They're unreliable. Sometimes your feelings tell you things are great when they're not great. Sometimes feelings tell you things are bad when they're actually really good, right? Your feelings are unreliable. If you live by your feelings, you will spend your life manipulated, listen, by your mood swings. If you live your life, if you build your life by your feelings, you will be manipulated by the moods that you have. You know, if you live by your feelings, man, I tell you what, you're going to be off in the weeds all the time. Here's what I know to be true. Most of what gets accomplished in the world today is done by people who don't feel like doing it. How many of you know that's true? Right? If you only do what you feel like doing, most of us wouldn't get up to go to work every day. I mean, let's just be honest about it, right? Do you get up in the morning like, man, I got another 8, 10 hours today, and I'm going to grind it? No, you would just stay in bed. Forget it. If you're thinking about your, the, the people you're going to be working with, you're like, Psh. if you were governed by your moods and your feelings, you just, you know what, I'm going to call in sick today. As a matter of fact, you'd be calling sick every day. You know, because here's the truth of the matter is, you know how we justify calling out sick? You know how sometimes you get up in the morning and you're like, I don't feel like, right? And so then you call your work and you're like, you know what, I'm just not feeling good. And then you tell yourself, I'm not lying. I mean, I just wasn't feeling good in the morning. But here you are off to the beach. You're off to wherever it is you're going because you felt better in the afternoon. Of course, because you woke up, right? But if you were governed by your feelings, you wouldn't do nothing, right? And so if you build your life simply on emotions, there's a word for that. You know what the word is? It's immaturity. If you build your life solely on your emotions, it says that you're very immature because that's how children are. Children base their lives on how they feel. That's immaturity, right? And so if that's how you're governed, you're very immature in your character because you're governed by how you feel. Now, in Judges chapter 21, verses 5, now mind you, this verse is about 5,000 years old. Listen to what it says. At, the t at that time, there was no king in Israel, and it says, and the people did whatever they felt like doing. That was the commentary of that time. People did whatever they felt like doing. Whatever felt right, that's what we're doing. And it says, that was a wicked generation. It was a wicked generation because they weren't governed by the truth. They weren't governed by God's laws or God's word. They were governed by how they felt. They did whatever they wanted to do. And this is why you want to build your life on the word of God. This is why we're doing this campaign, Rooted, because we want you to be rooted in the word. We want you to be sound in your thinking, in your decision-making, in your choices, right? Not governed by every whim that you feel, right? Because God's word is perfect. It's inerrant. It is flawless, and you can trust it. In the years that I've been walking with the Lord, God, I can tell you, and it's been over 30 years, God has never led me astray. His word has never led me astray. It is sound, it is true, it is tested. God's word is true. The second thing, amen, you can say amen to that because it's solid, right? The second thing, if I'm going to become a person who's integrated God's word in every area of my life, not only do I have to build my life upon it, but I have to feed on it. I have to feed on it. You have to feed on the Bible to get the strength that you need. The Bible tells us that the word of God is spiritual food. It's spiritual food. You know what I mean? And in fact, it uses several pictures to describe the Bible this way. The Bible is described or likened to as water, as milk, and as meat, and as bread. You know, the Word of God is referred to those things. It's spiritual sustenance that imparts spiritual life, right? You know, and unless you feed yourself in the milk and the meat and the bread of God's Word... You're going to lack the spiritual strength that you need to live out your faith, to live out a life of faith, and so you need sustenance. And if I could just say this, coming to church on Sundays, 
If that's the only time you're in the Word, it's not enough. I mean, ask yourself this question. If you ate once a week physical food, do you think you'd be good? Do you think you'd be healthy? Absolutely not. You'd be malnourished. You know what I mean? You'd be weak. You know, you'd be uh, hangry all the time, right? You'd be upset all the time because you were malnourished. And so you need to be nourished spiritually in order for you to live out a healthy life of faith. And so you have to be feeding yourself constantly all the time. Colossians 3.16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. In other words, let it, let it move into you. Let it inhabit you. Let it nourish you. Let it take residence in you in a rich and profound and life-giving way. Because that's what God's word does. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are life. They are life and truth. The words that I speak unto you are life. And so as you are intaking the word of God, life is being imparted to you. Life is being imparted to you, and it's an important thing. And so it's really important. So how do we feed on the word of God so that we're well nourished in the truth? Well, I talked about this in one of the sessions, but I'm just going to go through this very quickly, right, so that you have it fresh in your mind. Number one, I receive God's word with my ears. The Bible says, Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. Like if you're not strong in your faith, chances are it's because you don't spend time in the word, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Second way to feed on the word of God is I read it with my eyes. So I hear it with my ears, but I read it with my eyes. Having a Bible on the coffee table isn't good enough. I remember at my aunt's house, there was this big old Bible, a holy by white thing on the table. It was, all it was is was decorative. It was a decorative thing on the table, and I thought, wow, they must be spiritual, but they ended up divorced. You know what I mean? They weren't, you know, obviously not that spiritual, you know what I mean? But it was a beautiful decoration, but let me tell you, that's not enough. If your Bible is a decoration piece, you're missing it. You're missing it because that's not going to help you. You know, I, you've heard politicians, oh, I have my grandfather's Bible. I don't care whose Bible is that. Are you reading it? Are you reading that thing? You know what I mean? Because everybody can say that. If it's a decoration piece, if it's just something that you have in your, in your library, but you don't open it up, it's not going to do you good. You've got to have the Bible in your heart. You've got to be daily partaking of it. You've got to read it with your eyes, right? And so in, in order for you to benefit from it, it's got to be a part of your daily life. The third way you feed on the Word of God is I research it with my hands and with my mouth. I'm talking about studying the Word of God. There's a difference between reading the Word of God, but also studying it, where you take the time to look at words and you take the time to really take notes and make observations, you know. You also study by using your mouth, talking it over with other believers. And this is what we do with Connect Group. This is what we do in men's group. This is what we do with women's group. We talk about the Word of God. That is feeding on the Word of God. Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen: as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. I love meeting with people in the Word. You know, I no longer lead a connect group, and I miss it because I used to do it all the time. But I am leading a group with men. I'm also leading different things, and so I just can't do that with everybody as I used to, but I'm doing other things, and I still meet with people. I meet with other pastors. I meet with other men, and, and so it's been good. But, man, there's nothing like that. And so if you're not a part of a connect group, if you're not a part of any group, I, I tell you, you're kind of ripping yourself off of something that would really bless your life, really bless, bless your life. It's not something that you should be cavalier about. It's something that you need to really get connected to. And if you need to change your connect group, let me just say this. Change it. If, you're, if, it's, if it's not happening for you, get out. Do, do something. And you know what? I give you permission. Start one of your own. Come and talk to me, Pastor Darren, and we'll help you start one. You know what I mean? Because if it's dead and stagnant, if it's inconsistent, if it's not happening, then get out. Do something else. Right? Because that's not what it's about. You need to be, it needs to be solid. Right? Because in order for you to benefit from it. So you need to feed, you need to research, and this is how that happens. The fourth way to feed yourself on the word is I reflect on it with my mind. I don't just read it, but I spend time meditating on the word of God. 
thinking about it, chewing on it, you know, considering it. And then finally, the last way I feed myself is I remember God's word, not just with my mind, but with my heart. And, and there's a difference between remembering with your mind and with your heart. The difference is this. You remember with your heart. You memorize scripture in your heart. And so that's what you will get in the habit of memorizing scripture. This is why we gave you memory verses through the campaign, that you would memorize them. You know, if I were to stand up here and talk about all the scriptures I've remembered over the years, it would take me a long time because there's many scriptures that have, that have been engraved in my mind and my heart that have served me well. Certain things that, you know, when I'm going through something, when I'm discouraged about something, man, I, these things come back to my mind and I reflect on the things that I remember. And so I need to feed on the word of God. This brings us to the third step, Right? If we were going to integrate the Word of God into every area of our lives, number three, I need to live by the Word of God, okay? Build on it, feed on it, live on it, right? The Word of God is not only food for your soul, but God's Word is your standard for living. It's your standard for living. It's the Word of God that sets the standard by which you judge everything else in your life. It's God's Word. It's the standard by which you make decisions for the things that you are facing in life you've got to base those decisions on something what's the what's the standard that you base your life on well for me it's God's word the Bible says this in Psalms chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night look at that Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but his delight, his passion, his hunger is in God's word or in God's law, and he meditates on it day and night. What does that mean? It means that if you want your life to be blessed, you don't build your life on the counsel of the world or on the way the world thinks, but you build your life on the way and what God says and what God thinks. The counsel of the ungodly, the stuff that you hear on the news, on the television, and movies, those things will ruin you. Those things will ruin your life. It's the talk that goes on around the world all the time. It's the values of the world. And so what he's saying here is if you want your life to be blessed, you don't live your life by that kind of counsel, but you live, build, feed your life on the word of God. That's what you do, right? It's the Word of God that will give you hope in crisis. It's the Word of God that will give you comfort in despair. It's the Word of God that will give you strength when you're weak. It's the Word of God that will give you counsel when you are confused. It's the Word of God that will give you uh, count, uh, excuse me, will give you guidance when you need direction. And it's the Word of God that will give you strength to resist temptation. And believe me, you face temptation every day. How many of you know temptations come in many different forms? A lot of times, it's, it's the plate in front of you. You know what I mean? It could be anything, but we face all kinds of things. And so we need the Word of God. And David says this in Psalms 119, verses 11. I've hidden your word in my heart. Look what he says. I've hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Do you know that the Word of God keeps you from sin? This is what keeps you from sin. David says, I've hidden your word in my heart. I've memorized it. So that I don't go off into the weeds. So that I don't go off into the deep end. So that I don't get careless and foolish or reckless in the things that I'm doing. I've hidden your word in my heart. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was being tempted, when Jesus was being tempted, there were three times the devil came and tempted him. And all three times, the only thing that Jesus used was what? The weapon of the word. That's it. He used the word of God to defeat temptation. And so if you want to, you know, again, be built up and nourished in your faith, you need to live it. You need to live it. Number four, to integrate God's word into every part of my life, I've got to act on it. I've got to act on it, right? Uh, James 1.22, again, we talked a lot about this. Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. If I'm going to church and hearing God's word and it's going in one ear and out the other ear and I'm not putting it into practice, guess what? I'm living a life of self-deception. I'm deceiving myself because the truth of the matter is 
We only believe the part that we actually live out. You can say you believe something, but if you're not doing it, do you really believe it? Do you really believe it? Until we learn how to put God's word into practice, it's not really doing you any good, right? You have to, you have to again, act upon it. So in order for God's word to change your life, to change my life, I must act on it. Hearing it and reading it is not enough. I must do it. I must act on it, right? And the last thing I want to give you, um, if, if I'm going to become that person that has integrated God's word into every as- aspect of my life, the most important, I must trust it. I must trust it. I build on it. I feed on it. I live by it. I act on it. And I trust it. I trust it. Why can't I trust the Bible? As we've been talking about, right? We did a whole a session on this, on the inerrancy and in the infallibility of God's word. The bottom line is God is truth and God will never, ever, ever lead you astray. God's word will never lead you astray. As a matter of fact, let me tell you, if you're in a season of your life where you have to make a lot of decisions, you want to be in church. You want to hear God's word. You want to be in your Bible because it will never lead you astray, right? God is truth. You know, I've had dear friends who love me give me advice that has been wrong. You know what I mean? As well-meaning as people are, they're people, and people are not, you know, infallible. People make mistakes. People, they blow it, you know. And so I've had people who love me give me counsel that's not solid all the time. You know what I mean? But here's the thing. God's word will never do that. It will always give you solid advice. You can always trust God's word because God cannot lie. If he tells you to go that way, go that way. If he tells you to do this, do it because it's for your it's, it's for your good. It's the right way. It's the right thing to do. Psalms 119, 105. And I call this the flashlight verse. <coughs> your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How many of you have ever feel like you're in the dark? You ever feel like you're in the dark? Like you just don't know what to do? You know, I've found myself in this situation many times where, you know, I don't have the slightest idea about things. And chances are you have been like myself, where you're just in a particular situation or you're facing a circumstance, whether it's professionally or personally or relationally, where you're like, you know what, I just don't have a clue. I don't know what to do. Well, Psalms 119, verses 105 says, Your word is a light to my feet and a lamp to my path. The next time you find yourself in that situation, open your Bible to that verse, read it, and tell God, God, you know what? You say that your word is a light to my feet and a lamp to my path. I need direction specifically with regard to this. And as you are praying in faith and, you know, getting into God's word, God will be faithful to guide you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? As you uh, don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, the Bible says he will direct you. He will direct you. And you'll be surprised how he does it. It may be through circumstances. You may wake up in the morning and boom, all of a sudden, the, the answer is as clear as day. You might be at work. Somebody says something and God just confirms it in your heart. That is it. You might be reading a verse, right? And then all of a sudden you come to church on Sunday and I'm teaching on that very verse and you're like, oh my gosh, God is speaking to me. God's word is a light to our path and God will keep his word. He's, you know, he says he's going to do it. He's going to do it. And so as I wrap up today, here's my challenge to you. Is even though we're wrapping up the series and we're wrapping up the campaign, my challenge is, don't stop doing what you've been doing for the past 40 days. Keep on digging in the Word of God. Keep on studying God. Keep the, the habits and the practices that you've been doing for the past 40 days. And watch what God does in your life as He grows you, as He brings depth to you. Watch what God does. I challenge you to keep on being in a small group. Stay connected. And like I said, if you need to change group, change groups. Right? And here's the thing. There is no exclusive group. So if your group becomes that way, 
That's not, that's not what's supposed to be. Come and talk to me about that, okay? But again, you know what? Get into somewhere where you're connected, where there's life, you're being built up. Because, again, it's very important that you're developing and growing in your faith, right? But keep the habits that you're learning because God will continue to enrich your life. You know, again, we're wrapping up the series, but my, my prayer is that, man, you guys are, you know, growing deeper in your roots and, man, you're growing more mature in your faith. Because as there's depth, right, there's more fruit and there's more width, and God can use your life. And that's the bottom line. God wants to use your life to do good things, right? But again, if there's no depth, he can't use it. But as there is depth, he can. And so may the Lord bless you as you continue to grow in your understanding of God's truth. Because that's my heart for you, that God will continue to enrich every area of your life. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the word today. I thank you that it calms our fears, it enlightens our mind, it strengthens our will, it grows our maturity. I thank you, Lord, that it calms our worries and it leads us in the dark. All the things that your word does, we want to commit to being part of an ongoing process of continuing in your word. And so, Lord, I pray, Father, Lord, that you just continue to do a deep work within the hearts and in the lives of your people, Lord, that you keep growing us and maturing us and that we, we become much fruit bearers to the glory of God, Lord. And so, Lord, I just pray your blessing upon these people. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you've never invited Christ into your heart, whether you're here or you're watching online, it's as simple as just saying, Lord Jesus, I invite you to take up residence in my heart and my life. I've, I've, I've made some mistakes. I, I know I've sinned, and I ask that you would forgive me for my sins. I know that you've died for my sins. And Lord, I just ask, God, that you would forgive me. And from this day forward, that you'd help me, Lord God, to serve you, to love you, and to walk with you as best as I know how. Thank you for dying for my sins and rising from the dead. And from this day forward, I confess you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.